Hi, I'm Limo Milan, and in this video we're going to look at Ableton Live's Utility device. So Utility is right at the end of our selection of audio effects, and basically what it is, is our Swiss Army Knife tool. So let's just do a lot of either corrective or specifically focused things to the audio to, to solve technical issues that we may have. Um, so let's, let's go through the features on here. So I've got it on my master track at the moment, and I have a, a project running. Uh, which is quite a stereo and, and deep sounding uh, example. Okay, so let's have a look at a couple of different tools that we have on here. So we have the mono button, which literally folds down the stereo signal and we're left with what remains equal between the left and the right channels. So if I press that now, you'll hear a, a, a massive reduction in the stereo width of the track, but this is how a lot of uh, systems can still be played for public address, where on the mixing desk, the output maybe from a DJ console will be, the left and right channels will be running separately into the mixing console, but to make sure that the PA system playing through it has a good sense of power, they'll pan the left and the right down to the center, so you effectively have a mono PA system. So if we do this, we can check how our music might sound on such a system, and make sure that there's no strange sort of loss of instruments because of stereo information that cancels out. So you can hear there the, the reverb of the, the snare and also those pads dramatically reduce in their presence and the brightness especially because there's stereo brightness but the, the mono part of the signal isn't so bright. So it's really important to check that kind of information. And based on the style of music you're playing and where you think it will end up being played, it's worth making sure you can have it mono compatible or in some styles of music, it's more about making sure that you have a very good stereo sort of sense of depth and, and stereo width and you forgo the, the challenges you may have if it's played in mono. So another section we have here is the bass mono. So I'm gonna just drag this over to my bass track We'll put that in context in solo mode. So the bass mono is basically doing exactly the same as the mono, except the sound has been split into two bands of frequencies. Anything below the cutoff point for the lower frequency band will be monoed. Anything above it will be left untampered with. So bass sounds generally, you don't want things, especially under 100 hertz, more likely towards 200, 3, 400 hertz. You don't want those to be stereo, as in differing volumes and different information in left and right channels. You want your bass to be centralized in the mix so it has the maximum amount of power. Um, historically, or for more niche kind of end formats as well, vinyl can have an issue in terms of getting to uh, be cut onto a record if the stereo, if the bass has too much stereo in there, um, although if you're taking your stuff to a vinyl pressing place and there's a mastering process involved, generally that will be done by the mastering engineer too, but it doesn't hurt to check yourself and make sure that this will translate well to the vinyl format. So if I press bass mono this time, and I'll just roll the cutoff, if you remember that, that point where the, the, the lower portion of frequencies are monoed and then everything above is left the same. If we go low and then we start raising that up, we should start hearing a change to how wide that bass seems as we listen to it. Okay, so it could be more obvious. So I'm gonna get a stereo effect actually and pop that before chorus. Let's just take bass mono off so you can hear how stereo this is now. So of course it sounds wide and fantastic, but that energy has kind of gotten lost a little bit in the lower frequencies. So I'm just gonna make sure that the, uh, the lower frequencies are the right kind of, uh, that the right point get turned into mono. So we can still hear all that smeared kind of stereo information, but you should hear that the percussive part of that bass became more forceful because it was united between the left and the right. It was turned into a mono signal. Okay, so we've covered overall broadband mono of the signal. So we turned it into mono, all frequencies, and we've looked at frequency specific mon uh, making the signal mono as well. So other things we have on here. So we have an input selection. So we can choose that we only listen to the left 
portion of the audio track if it's a stereo signal, or we can choose that we only listen to the right. By default, it's listening to both, it's listening to stereo. Or it could be that the source sound we've got sounds right, maybe it's a stereo recording of a drum kit, but the placement of the microphones is the reverse to the way you want it to be. Maybe it's a, a stage presence, so you, you're hearing the drum kit as if it's played in front of you, uh, and you want it to sound more like it's coming from the drummer's perspective, so you want to flip the left and the right over. So we have the swap button to be able to do that. Now the left and the right controls are quite useful. One, if you've accidentally recorded a track as stereo, but you only were actually recording one input, so maybe you were playing guitar, you had it inputted to input one on your uh, audio interface, but you didn't set the audio track to record just input one, you set it to record one and two, you could get around the problem of it being on one side of your recording by telling Utility to just lift, listen to that left hand side of the signal. Alternatively, if you're into sampling from classic recordings, if you look at old recordings like the Beatles when basically when stereo was the a brand new format and people were experimenting with what what you could do with stereo sometimes there's certain sounds within the song performances that are hard panned so the guitar might only be on the left hand speaker and maybe you want to sample that and you don't want to pick up the drums that are on the right hand side of the mix so you could set utility to be on the left hand side and then use that part of the sample that portion the left hand side as your source sound so that's our input selection here we have a phase reversal switch here, which is especially useful when we're trying to layer sounds up. So let me show you how that works. If I, let's get two kick drum samples. So I'm deliberately just gonna hold command so they are stacked on top of each other there. And let's just solo those two out. Now, there's two layers to this, as, as you can see, there's a, first layer and a second layer. Now right now, if we just loop this so it loops about every, every half bar, to command and now to loop that. Oops, I highlighted that wrong, command and now. Um, we have this sound. Just mute the other ones. So one's a very dry very powerful kick. The other one's quite powerful too, but it has a lot of ambience, so it's really creating the air of our sample too. Now, if you look at the actual content of our two samples, we have parts in the top layer where the waveform's in a positive cycle, and during that portion, the more detailed kick that's underneath is doing quite a lot of changes in terms of its uh, positive and negative positioning. Now. Basically, when you're combining samples, it's like a tug of war. So one sample's pulling the signal one way, and if the other sample's trying to pull the signal the other way, you end up with the middle point between the two values of those two samples. So what can happen when you're layering samples is one new layer is having a negative impact on a very important part of the original sample. It's pulling one way, which is having a negative effect on the actual timbre of the, the layers that you're going for. So we can use utility to get around that. So if we go for utility on here, drop it to the second layer, and we set it to a reversed phase. Now it's a stereo sample, so I'm going to reverse the phase for the left and the right. And basically that's done a polarity flip. So it's basically the same as taking this image and just flipping it upside down. So what was up is now down and, and vice versa. So let's see if this is, is clearly audible when we do it. It should be because it's quite a, a dense sample in terms of frequencies. So I'm going to listen to it without flipping the polarity of that second layer. And then I'm going to turn utility on, which is set to phase reverse on the left and right channels. So everything's 180 degrees in terms of its rotation. And then we should hear a difference of the interaction of this layer with the original or the first drum layer as well. So hopefully you can hear that, especially that initial impact is much better of the combination of the two samples when the second layer has had its phase flipped and reversed. So that utility is really good for experimenting with layering sounds. And as you add a new one, add a utility, 
and set it to flip the reverse, turn it on and off, and figure out which of the two positions is the most complementary to the sound you've already built with the, with the initial layers that you started with. So we're gonna look at the mid and side balance of the utility device now, which is basically allows us to blend between what's uniform in the middle of the mix, so what's the same on the left and right side of our mix, that's our mid signal, and our side, which is the differing information of the left and the right speaker. So we have two modes here. We have mid and side mode, and then we have width mode. Now width mode is the default setting on here, and this allows us to go from having the signal mono at 0% through to 100% where the mid and the side balance is as it should be without utility on at all, and then move towards increasing the volume of the sides, and then basically figuring out what balance are those that we want. Now I'm going to show you how that sounds first and then I'm going to show you a bit of caution that you need to take when you're playing around with the balance of these two signals. Okay, so just as when we were moving to mono uh, earlier, and we could hear certain bright sounds getting cancelled because they were very bright and stereo. Um, what's happening here is at a certain point, the sides are becoming overpowering in their volume when we move to the right hand side. And we find that we've got a very impressively wide sounding uh, mix in this case. Um, but when we turn that balance into mono, you'll find a lot of cancellation happens because the sides are the things to go when we fall to mono. And what we've done there is turn them up. So they're now taking up more volume in terms of what's available in the mix. So when we fall to mono, the volume drastically drops. So I'll show you that. I'm gonna get another utility device and I'm gonna put it in mono. So as I change the nature of the mid and side balance of my mix, we're gonna constantly hear how that translates to mono as well. So you see how, even though I'm increasing the volume right now, the actual, the volume of the, uh, the, the mix at the moment is staying the same. If I turn mono off though, and we do that again, you'll hear that the actual stereo version of the signal is, is dramatically louder. If you look at the master track there, you'll see the volume increase. So we have another way of dealing with this. We have the mid and side mode. Now, I may have mentioned this earlier, that the mid and side mode is a bit more like a crossfader between the mono signal and the stereo sound, whereas the other option, which was the width control, was turning up the sides. The mids were staying the same and the, the sides were being increased in volume. This time we're moving between fully just mid signal over to fully just side. And this is where it will sound really strange and, and spatial when we're fully at the sides because it's all the information that's completely unique between the left and the right speakers. Now as an analysis tool, it's really interesting to listen to tracks that you admire in terms of reference tracks and listen to just the side sig signal to hear what these producers are putting into their stereo parts of their mixes. You'll find lots of the high sounds like cymbals and, and maybe some pads and, and high lead lines have a bit of information in the sides as well as strong forwards information in the mids too. Um, and you'll hear a ghostly version of maybe vocal reverbs and those sorts of things. So you get a sense of what the producer uses to create their stereo effects. So it's a very good analysis tool, but it is also a balancing tool. So we can uh, balance this in terms of our stereo balance between the mid and the sides, figure out how wide we want the track to be. And we can use the second utility again to turn it into mono and just check it translates okay into a mono mix. Okay, so that's, that's a fairly good compromise. A, a touch more balance towards the side, so it sounds a little bit wider. Um, but when we flip to mono, it's not dramatically being reduced in volume. So it's not too extreme a balance of the mid and the sides. So there's just a couple more controls to go through on utility. We have an output gain, which is very useful throughout your processing, especially if you're using a, a device or a plugin that doesn't actually have an output control on it. Maybe it's a distortion unit, doesn't have a way of 
toning down the output volume, stick a utility afterwards, and at least before that signal passes on to the next device, you can reduce it a little bit to have a good gain stage of what you're doing. We have a balance control, so if you've got a recording that seems a little bit unbalanced between the left and the right, so we can adjust that here. We have a mute, so we can just mute the whole thing in terms of uh, cancelling out the audio. And we also have what's called a DC offset. So DC offset is basically, there's a middle line when a speaker should be at resting state. And when we see the waveform moving forwards, the speaker, let's say the speaker's facing this way, the speaker pushes out, and then it passes that resting state, that zero line in the middle on the waveform, and then it goes to its negative space as well. Now DC offset, is when a signal gets either recorded in a way that the waveform isn't centered around that resting point, or something synthetic or processing-wise to produce the sound that's ended up being off balance with the actual uh, resting point. You should hopefully have a fairly equal distribution of forwards motion and backwards motion on your waveforms. And if it becomes very offset, you're inefficiently using your speakers. Your whole mix could be well balanced, and one sound could be dramatically pushing the mix too far forwards to the forwards part of the speakers and your speakers aren't being efficient and it won't sound very powerful. So the DC offset button here just corrects that. It takes the waveform and resettles it back into that center point so you have a more efficient use of forwards and backwards motion of your speakers. So that's the utility device. As I did say, it's a Swiss army knife, so there's many times you might reach for it to do different tasks. Gain stage is a really important one. Make sure you get your levels correct from one device to the next, and if needed, use the uh, utility device to do that. We've got lots of options in terms of setting those mid and side balances to get the right balance of st stereoness and mono compatibility. We can choose to sample from input sources, left and right speakers, swap them over if the recording's not the, the orientation we want it to be. And also we have those useful bass monos, which is generally useful either on your mix to make sure that mono is compatible or use it per sound like kicks and basses to make sure that that lower information is uniform down the left and right speaker and is powerful.